A big hello and welcome to another edition of Conservation Conversations with Bird Life South Africa. Um, some of you will be disappointed to see that you're not being hosted by the lovely Melissa tonight, but fear not, she's the one giving the feature presentation. So you'll see a lot more of her than me, don't worry. My name is Andrew de Bloch, and I'd like to welcome all of our viewers tuning in through Zoom and Facebook Live tonight. As always, you can communicate with us through the Zoom chat room and ask your questions to the speaker throughout the webinar using the Q&A box or the comment feeds. Our speaker, Melissa, will answer these at the end of the webinar. This past Saturday, we hosted the first ever virtual African bird fair, and I'm very happy to say it was a resounding success. We'd like to remind you that you can still access all of the content on the virtual platform until the end of September. And if you paid to watch our keynote conservation lecture by Peter Harrison, which was excellent, this will be available to view until Friday at six o'clock. Uh, feel free to let us know what you thought of the Virtual African Bird Fair in the chat feed. And indeed, that is tonight's pre-webinar questions. If you have any other comments, just pop them in the chat. Don't forget, you can also use the hashtag Conservation Conversations if you'd like to engage with us on social media. And if you missed out on any of our previous webinars, you can watch the recordings on the BirdLife South Africa YouTube channel or listen to the, the via the new podcast channel on all ma major podcast streaming services. We've received a lot of support over the last few months, and we are grateful to all of the viewers who've donated towards the production of these webinars. You can support us by donating through the Quicket Donations platform. Simply scan the QR code or visit the Conservation Conversations website to find the link to the donations platform. Every little bit helps us to keep these talks free for all to learn and enjoy. It's a new month and a new Jakarta Media monthly giveaway competition. You can enter via the Conservation Conversations website, but please remember that this, com this competition is only open to South African-based viewers. And here's a question for you. Have you ever wanted to explore a big five area on two wheels and get to see the bushveld's birds from your bicycle? You can join the BirdLife South Africa team for our annual cycle in the bushveld at Abilana Game Reserve, just outside Kruger National Park from the 5th to the 8th of November. Um, space is limited, so be sure to sign up soon, as those places will go quickly. For more information, please contact Cyril Nike, whose email is currently up on screen, and we can give you those details in the chat box as well. Don't forget to tune into the next installment of the Better Birding webinar series tomorrow night at 7.30. Mike, Dave, and Dom will be delving into the wonderful world of sheer water and petrol identification. This is the third in their series on pelagic birds, and I watched the first two, and they were both absolutely excellent. I do guide pelagics of Cape Town and I was still learning a whole lot of new information. Um, it's really a wonderful production and uh, you will have seen Mike alongside me at the Virtual African Bird Fair quiz, which Melissa just happened to scoop the title of. So well done to Melissa and uh, we look forward to watching Mike, Dave and Dom in action tomorrow night. You can visit their Facebook page, Better Birding, to find out some more. So on to tonight's speaker and our presentation. So I don't know if you'll all agree with me, but I hate it when you meet someone new and it comes out that you're a birder in a social context and the inevitable question comes up, comes through or comes out. So what's your favorite bird? I personally find that such a difficult question. Um, I don't know if they mean my favorite South African bird, my favorite bird in the whole world, the favorite bird that I've actually seen before, my favorite bird sighting. Um, and I, I'm inclined to give people a top 10 rather, which they're usually not that interested in. But I know one person who has a very emphatic answer to that question, and that is my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Melissa Howes Whitecross, and she's going to tell you about her absolute favorite bird tonight, the Secretary Bird. Melissa is our Landscape Conservation Program Manager at BirdLife South Africa. She's also known as our technical guru, as I said in the, the pre-webinar chat. Um, and she's just one of our big go-getters of the organization. She's just renowned for being efficient and very good at everything she does. And I'm sure that tonight will be no different, not to put any pressure on you, Melissa. <laughs> so with that, uh, oh, of course, she, she did her PhD at uh, Wits University. Um, funnily enough, it actually had nothing to do with birds. It was more to do with uh, ecology and plant phenology. And I'm sure she can tell you more about that if you want to know. You can ask her a question in the... Q&A box, um, but she is now an expert on birds and she of course did a lot of birding 
uh, as part of her PhD is she was based uh, mostly at Nails Flay Reserve. So there's plenty good birding to be done in that area. So Melissa, I'm going to hand over the floor to you and we all look forward immensely to what you're going to tell us about sacred birds. Thank you very much, Andrew, for that very generous introduction. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for stepping in and hosting tonight so that I can come here and do my thing. And just a, a big hello to all of you that have joined us this evening to come and listen to me talk about, as Andrew said, my absolute favorites. I don't make that a secret. And uh, <laughs> I'm hoping by the end of tonight, a few more people will join the favorites club for the secretary bird. But uh, before I get going to tell you all about these fantastic raptors, I really do just need to thank my colleagues. Um, Ernst Ratiff and Dr. Hanleen Smith-Robinson were the original uh, starters of the BirdLife South Africa Secretary Bird Project. So without them, I wouldn't be here tonight telling you about the amazing work that we've been able to do on this species. So thank you to both of them. And our two newer collaborators who've come on board for the second leg of the project, Dr. Caroline Howes-Whitecross and Dr. Patrick Byholm, who've joined us. And then, of course, the many donors who have contributed towards this project through the years, but in particular tuned in tonight, Nick and Jane Prentice, as well as Letitia Steinberg, and colleagues from ESCOM as part of the Angula Partnership, and of course, the Rupert Natur Stichting, who funded my position at BirdLife South Africa. So a big thank you to all of you for the support that you have shown our organization and this project. So I thought a good place to start this journey tonight would really be way back in the day at Mapani Camp in Kruger National Park. And you'll see in the bottom left of your screen there, the 8th of August 94 was the very first time that a very young Melissa got to see a secretary bird. And I must thank my late uh, Opa who really introduced me to this amazing hobby. And uh, yeah, I'm really grateful to him. This was a, a turning point in my life and really did set the scene for me to move on and study birds in the long run. So thanks for those memories. And I hope that sets the scene for an amazing talk that's to come, hopefully. But uh, I'd really like to start off by stating the case for why I think this is Africa's most charismatic bird. And uh, when you have a look at the secretary bird, you really can understand why they are the supermodels of the bird world. I mean, just look at those legs and that amazing hairdo. Uh, this bird has graced numerous covers of magazines. It was the face of Nat Geo's um, Year of the Bird in 2018. It also then took the title of 2019 Bird of the Year at BirdLife South Africa. It is also currently the cover model for the Roberts Field Guide. And believe it or not, the secretary bird, not our national bird, the blue crane, uh, dons the top of the South African national emblem and it is also on the national emblem of Sudan. So one of the few species that actually graces two national coat of arms. So I really do think there is absolutely no reason to doubt how charismatic and beloved the secretary bird is and I'm yet to come across someone who says they do not have a fondness for the amazing secretary birds. And they've certainly been captivating through the ages. Uh, on the left of your screen there, you will see a hieroglyph that was uncovered in ancient e or from ancient Egypt. And um, this is a secretary bird that they think was traded to the Egyptians from the former land of Put, which they think is South Sudan. And um, they're still trying to uncover that. And this little uh, depiction on the wall in Egypt is one of the clues leading to them uncovering that mystery. But this really is probably one of the very first secretary birds to find its way to Egypt. Um, as you'll see in a later slide, their distribution is very much south of the Sahara Desert in Africa. They've also um, been captured by a number of different artists. So there's a great uh, Japanese anime called Agretsuko, and I apologize for my pronunciation of that, but this is Washimi, who is a character on that uh, Japanese anime comic. And of course, on the Cornell uh, Wall of Birds, which is an amazing mural, and I'd highly recommend Googling um, the Wall of Birds from Cornell University, the secretary bird has pride of place inside Africa. And it is certainly deserving of that title being one of the few monotypic families in Africa. Now, as I said, the secretary bird was awarded the title of Bird of the Year last year, and I had a lot of fun running this campaign for BirdLife South Africa. But I think one of the best things to come out of the Bird of the Year campaign, besides the amazing education materials, such as the poster, the lesson plans, and the comics that were designed by Chrissy Clitty and are available for download on our website. And I'd highly recommend going and 
getting your copies and working through them with any young children that you might have in your families or um, if you're a teacher going and downloading those. The best thing that came out of the bird of the year um, was certainly the fluffies and you can see the fluffy on the left hand side of your screen there. We still have some at BirdLife South Africa and if you'd like to order yours you can get in touch with the shop for the birds and I'd highly recommend getting yourself one, getting your grandkids one, um, get everybody you know one. They're really cute and a wonderful gift to pass on to friends and family. So there was a couple of um, debates around whether secretary birds were true raptors or birds of prey. And don't worry too much about the complexity of the spider diagram that you see in front of you. All you need to really know about these um, evolutionary trees is that the closer you are to each other on a branch, the more closely related you are in terms of evolutionary history. Now, the secretary birds split off about 40 million years ago into the Sagittaridae, and their closest living relative, in fact, is the osprey. So you can see sitting very snugly there in the occipitary forms, which are our raptors. And uh, there's absolutely no doubt, thanks to Prum et al. in 2015, that our secretary birds are indeed a raptor. And there's also the South American Ceremas, which look quite similar to secretary birds, but are quite a different bird. And they fall into a very different clade of birds, um, along with the falcons. So not joining the vultures and some of the other larger birds of prey that we know. So some of the characteristics of a secretary bird, they live for approximately 10 to 15 years in the wild. Uh, the oldest known secretary bird, who I'm going to show you in a moment, is in fact Madeline, who's housed at the Hawk Conservancy Trust. She's currently 28 years old and still kicking literally every day in displays. So they do seem to live quite long in the right conditions. But uh, as we know, following these birds in the wild can be quite tricky. So 10 to 15 years is very much a best guess. They weigh in at a whopping four kilograms and they have a wingspan of approximately two meters wide. So they are rather large birds when you see them flying overhead. They'll often be mis mistook for cranes or storks. Um, but this wonderful two meter wingspan bird soaring over your head is quite a sight to behold. And they also hold the, the record as the tallest bird of prey coming in at 1.5 meters tall. So if you are a small child staring a secretary bird in the face, it could be a rather intimidating prospect. They'll definitely be looking you in the eye, if not over your head. Now, this is Madeline, and this was a study that was carried out by Portugal et al. in 2016. What they did was they filmed Madeline kicking a snake, which she has been trained to do, and you can see that absolute pinpoint accuracy that she has to actually stand on the tail while trying to strike the snake in the head. Now granted, this is not a live snake. It is very much a dummy with a, a force measure underneath it. But the force that they calculated Madeline is capable of kicking is five times her own body weight, which is roughly four kilograms. So you can imagine the amount of force that is being delivered with absolute pinpoint accuracy to the head of her prey. And that really is what makes the secretary bird such an epic hunting machine. Um, they rely heavily on their eyesight to find their prey but they are pretty much capable of taking all sorts of different prey items. They're most famous for their ability to take snakes. And you can see a number of photos in this um, collage of them eating snakes. Um, top left, you'll see a ninja going after a locust. And what is pretty incredible and not a lot of people know is that secretary birds actually eat around 87% of their diet as arthropods. So locusts, beetles, spiders, um, they really do rely heavily on insects to survive and only taking around 1% of their diet um, is, being actually, is being made up of snakes. So um, despite their fame for their ability to kill these snakes, they very much rely on other prey items, in particular those insects. Now this is just a video showing you how secretary birds hunt. You'll see very much visual keeping an eye on their prey and delivering that solid blow, that one grabbing a locust but uh, really using that bill just to do the final dispatch. It's very much the feet that are in charge of delivering the powerful blows that subdue their prey. Now I mentioned that these birds are found south of the Sahara. Secretary birds are very much open landscape ambassadors. So they do occur in our savannas, but it's very much our open savannas. Those of you who are familiar with Kruger National Park's ecology will know that the eastern side of the park is the basalts, 
which is a far more open system. So a lot of grassland, very little dense bush. And that is sort of the last remaining stronghold for our secretary birds. They will occasionally move into slightly more woodier areas. You may have come across the Punda Maria pair that was living under the um, Cahora Bassa power lines using that nice open clear cut along the transmission lines to forage. But uh, they very much need open habitats. And I'll show you a little bit later on what I mean by that open habitat dependence. But you can see widely distributed across Africa, um, sadly more thin on the ground than we'd like to see them, but uh, just avoiding those deserts and the forests. And this is really what ideal secretary bird habitat looks like. This is out in Warden, in the Free State, beautiful open grasslands. This is really prime habitat for secretary birds to do their thing. But sadly, our grasslands in South Africa in particular are shrinking as they are across the world. Um, this is just a quick ecology 101 for South Africa and for those of you not from South Africa. Um, really what we've done is break South Africa up into biomes. So these are dominant vegetation units. You can see the big green central area is our grassland biome dominated by open grassland landscapes surrounded by that nice yellow savanna biome. So that's a mix of trees and grass and that can be in varying densities. And you can see moving into that more orangey left central area, that's what we call the Nama Karoo. So the more west you move in South Africa, the more arid the landscape gets. And that little black swathe along the border of Namibia is starting to become true desert. So we tend not to find too many secretary birds in that desert landscape. But all of the other biomes, pretty much we have records of secretary birds barring our heavily forested habitats. So the Indian Ocean coastal belt that blew on the eastern side of South Africa. And then of course the, the Nizana forests and Tsitsikama forests in the south. Now in 2019, we did our first bird lasso bird of the year challenge. And we were really lucky to receive over 800 records contributed by just over 130 different observers. So every single one of those little pins is a contribution from someone using the bird lasso app during 2019. And we were absolutely blown away by the amount of data that came through in that single year. This is essentially the first snapshot we have of where our secretary birds still are in South Africa. And obviously we haven't been able to capture all of them, but it certainly has given us a very good indication that our grasslands highlighted in green on your screen are very much the heartland of our secretary birds to this day. So it's really important that we focus our conservation efforts on keeping those grasslands safe and ensuring that they are protected going forward. Now, this is a map out of our National Biodiversity Assessment. And what this map is highlighting is the rate of habitat loss since 1990, all the way through to 2014. Now, unfortunately, the darker the red, the more transformation we've seen um, of natural habitats into some other land use. So that could be agriculture, it could be mining, it could be human settlements. Um, but for whatever reason, that landscape has largely been altered out of a natural state into some other land use. And you can see within that gray area, which is just the, the grasslands once again, we've had quite a bit of transformation through our grassland biome. And sadly, it is one of our most threatened biomes. And that's a finding by the National Biodiversity Assessment. Um, so it really doesn't bode well for our poor secretary birds who very much rely on that grassland biome to survive. What you see here is just highlighting some of that transformation. So all the areas that are still in charcoal are considered under relatively natural land use. So you can see Kruger National Park up in the northeast of um, South Africa, still very much in its natural land use. But within that grassland biome, lots of peach, indicating lots of human expansion, lots of agriculture, and lots of alteration of our grasslands. So putting pressure on our poor secretary birds to try and eke out their living alongside we humans. And I think this point was driven home in particular for me this year. Uh, one of our new attract birds that is um, Casanovia, you can see being held by Dr. Caroline House whitecross there on the screen. And in the bottom left, Dr. Darby Deswart, who very kindly alerted us to the presence of this nest and helped us ring the bird. Um, this nest was just southwest of Bloemfontein on the Yachesfontein Road. We successfully fitted Casanovia with a tracking device and you can see that yellow track on your screen 
the black star was um, Casanova's nest and she moved all over the show during our time tracking her. Um, she fledged really nicely from her nest and dispersed off into the east side um, of sort of the southeast of Bloemfontein and was doing really well until we noticed that her tracking device sadly had started to slow down and she wasn't moving as well as we'd seen her move in the past. And this was moving sort of into the middle of winter. So um, Dr. Davi Deswat and his intern Apiwe very kindly headed out when it looked like we may be recovering a carcass um, to go and check up on Casanova. And on the 17th of July, luckily um, Casanova was found still to be alive, but in very, very poor condition. Davi very kindly drove her down to Riet Griesel, who kindly did some rehab on Casanova, fed her back up, got her strong again, and we were able to release her again about 10 days later. Um, Casanova did quite well moving around the Springfontein and Bethulie areas, and then she took a massive flight all the way down to Stackstrom down in the Eastern Cape, and sadly, uh, her tracker stopped moving again on the 7th of August, and once again, Casanova had really struggled to find food and after a very, very severe frost was found under a bush by a farmer that we managed to contact to go and check up on her. And this really just drove the point home for me that these birds are really facing tough conditions out there. And on top of this, when it's a really cold winter, this winter in particular in South Africa has been brutal. We've had numerous frost events, which wipe out a lot of the prey species for these grassland birds. When you compound all of that with a very fragmented landscape, it really is difficult for these birds to find enough food to survive. And sadly, this was one of the young birds, a completely natural loss, it happens, but it just really emphasizes how tough it can be out there for these young birds. Now, one of the more natural threats to our birds, which is a consequence of our uh, sort of climate change drivers. So we know we've pumped a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And because our atmosphere is now full of carbon dioxide, which is a really good condition for trees like Dicrostachys or some of your acacia species to grow really well, um, we have started afforesting, um, not on purpose, but nevertheless, we have started to cause our grasslands to become very bushy and wooded. You can see a photo there from Spionkop that was taken in 1955 at the top. And this is what it looks like in 2012 completely thicketed, full of acacia species. There's absolutely no way that a secretary bird is gonna be able to navigate that woodland. And this is also partly the reason that we're starting to see big declines in our secretary birds across Kruger National Park. Obviously Kruger has a number of other factors. Um, elephants are changing the ecosystem ecology and we're seeing conditions that are not suitable for our secretary birds that need these more open landscapes to um, thrive. And this is partly to blame as to why we're seeing these decreases in secretary birds, not just in Kruger, but across South Africa, as our more open landscapes become more and more wooded and altered. Now, one of the great studies by Megan Lofty Eaton in 2017 was looking at reporting rates of secretary birds in Kruger. And one of the patterns that Megan was able to tease out from her data was that in areas where there is more than 20% woody cover, you start to lose secretary bird sightings. So that really speaks to just how sensitive these birds are in needing those open landscapes. If we look at a very similar species, the southern ground hornbill, they can deal with woody species right up to 40%. But anything over 20%, we really start to see a drop off in secretary bird presence. So these birds are very sensitive to these open landscapes. And it's a dangerous landscape. So not only do we have land use being changed and different land management regime, regimes. You can see that top photo there. We've got a settlement on the left-hand side and a relatively more pristine and natural area, but there's a power line running through that natural area, as well as a road. Lots of different things to navigate in this new world that these birds find themselves in. Land management can be a huge threat. If land is not managed correctly, it can suffer erosion, it can be overgrazed, and this all has an impact on the prey abundance and quality of the grasslands that these birds have to forage in. In a degraded grassland, you don't get as many locusts, you don't get as many rodents, and it really does make it difficult for these birds to survive. We've also got the threat of secondary poisoning. So when farmers head out and spray their fields with pesticides, a lot of the locusts and the rodenticides that are used against the rodents 
And um, when these birds are consuming those um, creatures that have been exposed to these toxic chemicals, they can often get uh, secondary poisoning, which can lead to fatalities or illnesses and weaken those birds so that they're not uh, performing at their optimal conditions. So it is another, another threat for these birds to navigate and sadly not one that's observed very frequently. Then of course we come to linear infrastructure. Now I do need to credit ESCOM. They have worked extremely hard for many, many years trying to deal with the threat that their power lines do face to birds. Sadly, our secretary birds are extremely vulnerable to collisions with power lines. And in the time that we've been tracking secretary birds at BirdLife South Africa, we've had three power line fatalities um, occur that we know of, of, of our tracked birds. And the strategic partnership between ESCOM and the Endangered Wildlife Trust reports that they've had 94 records over the last two decades of secretary bird mortalities. So these linear structures are really a big barrier for our secretary birds. And some of you may have read about Quasi last year. Sadly, Quasi was the very first secretary bird that I got to fit a tracking device to, uh, not far from the Angula pump storage scheme where we do a lot of work with ESCOM. Quasi was um, doing really well in her her natural environment, hanging around her nest where that white star is. And on her very first trip away from home, a mere 26 kilometers, Quasi sadly flew into a power line on a particularly windy day and sadly fell to her death approximately 30 meters. And uh, Karina Kutza, our Angula project manager, very kindly went out to go and uh, check what had happened. And sadly, the news was not happy. But uh, this collision has at least alerted us to the fact that these power lines are there and they are a threat. There are a number of other really important species in the area, Cape vultures, blue cranes, crown cranes. And so Quasi's de death won't be in vain. Hopefully ESCOM is going to move and put flappers on that line and try and make it a little bit less dangerous for all of the birds that will occur there. Um, but it was a tragic loss to lose this young bird and sadly highlights again the dangerous world that these young birds are facing when they leave their nests. And that's not the only linear barrier. I apologize, this is a slightly graphic slide, but uh, our secretary birds are very much at risk from fence lines. And those of you who've driven around South Africa will know that there are millions upon millions of fences for these birds to contend with. And sadly, Getting tangled up and starving to death is a horrific fate that befalls way too many secretary birds. And uh, one of our more recent birds that we've tracked, Houdini, when we caught him, he actually flew off of the nest and got away from us for a brief period. And after stumping around in the felt for over an hour trying to find him, I found him tangled up in a barbed wire fence. So luckily, being tenacious as we were and determined to find him, we didn't give up and we managed to untangle him, fit the tracking device and put him back without any major damage. But if we'd not been able to find him, it would have been a huge tragic loss. This young bird would have starved to death in that bottom barbed wire fence and nobody would have found him. Unfortunately, when there's a lot of long grass around these fences, often it does obscure the view for them, but uh, it's not always the case. These birds are very, very susceptible to getting tangled up in these fence lines. Now, that's a lot of really bad news, and I'm afraid I've got one more slide of bad news, but there will be good news at the end, I promise. Our secretary bird team has been involved with BirdLife International and the IUCN Red List. And in 2004, secretary birds were considered least concern. And in 2011, noticing some declines in the population, they were uplisted to vulnerable. So that is a threatened category and means that our birds are in trouble. After much debate and a lot of uh, data provided from around Africa, I'm afraid to report that starting next year, secretary birds will officially be uplisted to endangered. Now, just to give you an idea of what this means, in the IUCN threatened species list, you can see that we've got various categories. Species that are found in this least concern category are great. That means there's lots of them and they're doing fine. As we start moving up the list, it's getting more and more threatened until you get to this critically endangered step, which is one step off of going extinct in the wild, and then of course, extinct forever, like the Mauritian dodo, which none of us want to see happen to these incredible birds. Just to show you some of the data that was presented for this uplisting here in South Africa, we've had two very successful atlasing projects. So SABAP1, which ran up until 1991, 
And then of course, SABAP2, um, the study that was performed was all the data up until 2013, which Sally Hoffmeyer published. And unfortunately, we've seen over 70% declines based on this atlasing data here in South Africa. A similar story in Swaziland, Aramonijim has published that we've seen up to 80% declines in secretary birds in Swaziland. Becky Garbett published a study in 2018 showing that a Botswana road count of raptors comparing 1995 to 2015 had seen an approximately 78% decline in secretary birds in Botswana. And unfortunately, in the Sahel region, which is largely made up of Northern Cameroon, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, we've seen approximately 99% declines. And unfortunately, the, the theory is that it is likely secretary birds have gone locally extinct in West Africa. There are the odd individuals that do disperse there, but for the most part, secretary birds are not being found across that Sahel region, which is hugely devastating. And we don't want to see that happen across any more of their range. Now, that's a lot of depressing news, but there is hope. And my amazing colleagues back in 2011, Ernst Ratiff and Dr. Hanaline Smith-Robinson realized that these birds were in trouble and with their uplisting too vulnerable, decided to take on the very ambitious project of tracking secretary birds in South Africa. And what I'm gonna share with you now is a little bit about what they've learned and what we've learned after their amazing hard work. So you can see on your slide there, that is a young secretary bird. We're only able to tag juveniles. The adults are just too difficult to catch. But what we do is we find a bird on the nest at about eight weeks old. We fit this tracking device onto their backpack. And we use a little Teflon harness and the devices are very, very small and don't weigh much in comparison to the bird's weight. So it's a bit like carrying your cell phone around with you. And off these birds go using the cellular network, we are able to get location pings and we find out exactly where those birds are. And you can see on the map there, the 10 different birds that Ernst was able to fit with tracking devices between 2012 to 2014. And what was really important when Ernst started the study was trying to unpack the life history strategy of these secretary birds. As well known as the secretary bird is, we actually don't know all that much about the secretary birds. We know where they breed. We often know how well they breed. And there's been quite a lot of work done, particularly by Davi Deswat, monitoring secretary bird nests. But we really didn't know what happened to these chicks once they left the nest and where those juveniles went or how they filtered back into the breeding population. So using these tracking studies, we were really hoping to start unpacking some of these questions. Now, to go back to the beginning a little bit, what we've done as part of this project is we've set up a breeding database. Now, this is not all of the points that we've got currently. You'll see there's a few gaps in the Northern Kalahari, as well as some of the Eastern Cape regions, but this just gives you an idea of how we're slowly starting to build up citizen science records of these different breeding secretary birds. And I'd really like to put a call out there to all of you listening tonight. If you do know of any secretary bird sightings, either historical or current, please get in touch with me. My email is on the screen, melissa.whitecross at birdlife.org.za. Pop me an email, let us know if you've got secretary birds breeding either on your farm or in a reserve that you visit. We really are trying to build up a database of where these birds still are and trying to make sure that we can secure those areas where they're still breeding. Now, what does secretary bird breeding look like? So incubation takes around 42 to 45 days. The nests are typically built on top of large single trees that don't have much surrounding them other than open felt. You can get a bit of a glimpse in that top left photo of what it looks like from the top of the nest. The nests are very much just a flat stick structure. The birds line them with grass and twigs and they will lay up to three chalky white eggs in a, in a go. And in very successful years, they are actually able to successfully raise all three of these chicks. Um, obviously, if conditions are tough, they'll usually only be able to push out one chick. But uh, in a good day, they can get all three of those chicks out. And it takes about 10 to 14 weeks for these nestlings to really get going. And they'll start to fledge away from the um, nest uh, at about 8 to 10 weeks. Um, but they will then disperse out of that territory um, and head off into the wide world between 4.2 to 6.8 months. So that is sort of the development process of these chicks. You can see at eight weeks, they really do get quite feisty. And that's when we come in and try and put our tracking devices on them. 
uh, but really amazing young birds to watch them develop from these weird looking alien things at seven days old until they start looking like little secretary birds at about six weeks old. Now, using the tracking data, this is a bird called Bling that was tagged on Sundela Nature Reserve. You can see the white star on the left side of your screen is where Bling's nest was. And Bling was actually um, hatched right next to the N1 highway. So you can see that N1 highway um, running along the top left of that image. And what we did was to try and start working out how these young secretary birds are using their natal territories, where they're going and how far from the nest they're going at what times. So we did some very basic calculations looking at the straight line distance from the nest to a point and what the time of day was that that bird was moving. And if I show you this on a moving graphic, you can see this is sort of what space use looks like for young secretary birds. So early on in our tracking, when the birds are about a month into their tracking profile, so that takes them to about 12 weeks of age, you can see the blue bar is very, very low down on your screen, not much happening, the birds are sticking on their nest. By the second month of tracking, they're starting to get a little bit more bold, often getting off the nest at about eight in the morning and moving not too far, about 200 meters from their nesting territory. And they'll explore and then come back to the nest to roost late in the afternoon. By month three, they're really starting to get adventurous, moving an average of about 800 meters away from the nest. You can see on those yellow bars. And something I'd like to point out here is that our secretary birds really don't enjoy getting their feet wet. So they typically don't get off the nest until about seven o'clock, which has given the grass enough time to dry with the sun coming up at about four or five o'clock in the morning. And then these birds will hop off their trees and get going and stomp around the felt through the heat of the day. And of course, by month four, when these birds are really starting to get adventurous, you can see them venturing over 1,600 meters from their nest. So getting close on to two kilometers, some of the birds um, as they explore their territories. And during this time, some of them will even sleep in neighboring trees. They don't actually come back to their nesting tree. So they really become kind of rebellious teenagers staying away um, staying out all night and visiting friends rather than staying with mom and dad at home. So that's sort of their development profile. It's very typical of a lot of raptors, but nice to see it plotted out in this way. And you can see those kernel density estimate circles really just showing how those birds expand their world as they get older and older. Now we can use these different estimates. So the two analyses that we've used is the minimum convex polygon, which is really just drawing a rough shape around every single point that you've got. So it's quite an overestimate of space use, but it really gives you an idea of just how widely these birds travel from their actual nests. So the red zones are where the birds' nests are. And you can see with this minimum convex polygon, on average, our 10 birds, we're using about 32 kilometers squared around their nests. But there's a slightly more finessed approach that you can use, which is called a kernel density estimate. And this really focuses on the density of points and where these birds are spending the majority of their time. So if we do this slightly more fine scale analyses, you can see that these birds are using roughly 1.2 kilometers squared around their nest during their initial development phase. Now, what does all of this mean? How do we use this to actually conserve these birds? So I showed you on the previous slide that we know they're traveling approximately 1.6 kilometers from their nest. We can then start using this to advise the likes of the wind energy developers. So I'm part of the Birds and Renewable Energy Forum and Birds and Renewable Energy Specialist Group, which is set up by our Birds and Renewable Energy Project Manager, Samantha ralston Patton, And she's been working really hard with different developers across South Africa, as well as with our partners at EWT, to make sure that we can translate this information to the developers and avian specialists that are doing studies to try and understand where they should put turbines so that it won't have an impact on different species. And so we've been having negotiations with them about how to put buffers around certain turbines and certain nests to try and keep secretary birds safe when they are found during scoping phases. And we're still having debates about them with what the exact buffer should be, but we've sort of pitched a two kilometer buffer to them for now. So we'll see if that actually gets taken up or not as we move forward. But it's really useful to have this kind of data and really provide rigorous scientific backing to these different industry partners so that we can advise them what the best solution is for our birds and their development. One of the other things that we looked at with our tracking data was the time spent in the natal home range. So that's very much the territory around a bird's nest. 
And you can see I've split all of our birds up by their various biomes. So your birds in the bottom half of this graph are very much in the arid landscapes. So we've got the Nama Karoo, your savannas and your succulent Karoo. And then of course we've got our more mesic grasslands, so wetter, hotter um, system. And you can see here, on average, our birds are spending about four and a half months in their territory. In interestingly, what we found was that the arid birds actually get out of their territories a lot faster than your more mesic birds. And what David Allen very kindly pointed out to me was that when our more arid land birds are breeding, the conditions are particularly good. Secretary birds won't breed if conditions are not optimal. So there's an abundance of food. When these arid systems come online and there's lots of good rain, these systems really pump and there's a really good abundance of food to grow these chicks quickly and get them off the nest and into the world. Our more music system is a lot more stable and conditions tend not to fluctuate as much from year to year. And so there's not as much pressure to get these birds off the nest as quickly. And with a lot of prey that is around, the parents tend to continue feeding a little bit longer and keeping those chicks on the nest a little bit longer. So on average, four and a half to six months is what these birds are doing in their natal territories. Now, back in the day when we started to try and understand what is happening to these birds after they leave their nest, we had to rely on ring recoveries. Now, uh, Terry Oatley did a great um, publication back in uh, 1995 looking at ring recoveries of secretary birds. And sadly, there were only four known ring recoveries, the most famous of which was by Rob Simmons from Sabi Sands Game Reserve. He tagged a young bird who just shy of four months later, pitched up in Namibia. And uh, that ring recovery was the longest known movement of a secretary bird ever recorded. So they really are capable of moving quite substantial distances. But the problem with these ring recoveries is that you just get two data points. We don't know what's going on in between those two points. But with modern technology coming online, we can start filling in some of those gaps with these amazing tracking studies where we can get up to five minute intervals of these birds moving. During Ernst's study, the majority of the birds, we were getting one hour interval records, but it allowed us to follow exactly where these birds were going and where in the landscape they were choosing to be. So during our initial study of this data, one of the aspects that we looked at was during this dispersal behavior in their first year of tracking, what is going on with these birds and how far are they moving? So on the bottom of your axis there, you can see we've got number of months since fledging. So that's when the bird leaves its nest. And on the left hand side, we've got the straight line distance to the nest. So that's not accounting for the actual number of kilometers that these birds have walked or flown. It's really just looking at how far these birds have moved away from their original territory. And we sort of used a five kilometer and 48 hour uh, limit to decide that these birds had actually dispersed. And as you can see in that map, a lot of these birds, when they do decide to leave their natal territory, it's quite a clear departure. So you can very much see them exit from that natal territory and they really do move off quickly. And one of the interesting things we found from the, these data was that our boys in the blue tend to move a lot further away, but tend to leave later than the girls who tend to stay within about 200 kilometers of their nest. But interestingly, our boys often return quite close to where they were initially hatched whereas the girls tend to stay that 200 meters away. They don't return to their natal, their natal territory. And one of the classic examples of this was Bling. Now, Bling was sponsored by BirdLife Northern Gauteng, and he moved off from Sondela. You saw his graph a little bit earlier. He was our first uh, international traveler, and he headed all the way up to the Mechadi Chadi Pans. He decided that he didn't like hanging out with the flamingos, and came slightly south of the pans and settled in a grassland in Botswana for quite a number of months before ultimately coming back to the northern suburbs of Pretoria, where he eked out a living in these very, very fragmented grasslands that remain in northern Pretoria. And you can see on the right hand side of the screen there, all these little patches of grassland that still remain. Bling would be spotted along the side of the highway, uh, on a patch of felt next to someone's house. He really did have to navigate this very, very transformed landscape that is the, the north of Pretoria. But he managed to do it. And uh, sadly, at the end of Bling's life, he was attracted to a felt fire underneath one of the transmission lines. And he flew into that power line and was fatally killed. And besides power lines, as we know, these birds have to face a number of different threats. So we know how fragmented this landscape is and these birds are trying to compete not just with each other, but other species, 
trying to establish their territories and get on with it. And the smaller their world becomes, the more pressure there is and the more competition there is between individuals to do this. And sadly, of the 15 birds that we've been tracking so far, we're sitting at a mortality rate for birds younger than three years old at 46%. This is a staggering amount. Two of those are confirmed natural mortalities. So Artemis sadly was trying to fly in on a very misty morning and literally flew into the side of a mountain. Um, she hit a cliff face and was found dead at the base of that cliff. Um, and of course, Casanova, who you've already heard the story of sadly starving to death. Um, our other birds are all linked to human mortality, sadly. Um, so it is a tough world out there for these young birds. And it's really staggering to see just how many of them we're losing before they manage to make it into the breeding population. Now, just an example of two of our other birds. So this is Strider and Archer. They were tagged on a nest in Calfinia. There were actually three birds on this nest, but we only had two tracking devices available. So Archer was the oldest, um, he was a male, and he weighed in at 3.1 kilograms when we tagged him. And Strider was his sister, slightly smaller, 2.9 kilograms. So Archer dispersed over 646 kilometers in just eight days. And you can see on the screen here, all these dots or squares are Archer moving across the northern part of South Africa, all the way down into Lesotho, and sadly, once he got into Lesotho, we lost connection with his tracking device after he'd spent a few days there and we were never able to recover his body. So we don't know what happened to him. But unfortunately, I don't think that this was a tracking device failure. And we think there is a high likelihood that he may have been killed by something or someone, which is very, very sad. But just look at that immense journey that this bird was able to do in its first 270 days of life. Just staggering to see how far these birds can move when the needs arise. His sister, on the other hand, Strider, decided that she was a West Coast girl. She initially went up north, spent some time on the edge of that desert landscape, and then came down all the way down to very close to the Cape Peninsula, ultimately settling here in the succulent Karoo biome, um, sort of halfway up South Africa's West Coast. So two very different journeys from siblings, but really interesting to see just where these birds end up after they leave their nests. And she, on her initial dispersal, did 230 kilometers in just three days. So really, really far movements from these birds. Now, one of the other interesting things that we found was that these birds show natal philopatry. Now, what that means is a straight line distance. Uh, if we have a look here, you've got your number of days since tracker fitment on the bottom of your axis. And then, of course, on the vertical axis, the straight line distance once again. We looked at the birds over the entire period that we tracked them and we took their absolute maximum distance from their nest and the time period that they achieved that and then we looked at their last known tracking point and where they were at that point point. and it was really interesting to see that for the majority of our birds they would disperse quite far as i've shown you the boys go very far but then they'd show this returning behavior and this is a concept known as natal philopatry so Logic goes that if you were raised successfully in an area by your parents, there's a much better chance of you successfully raising a chick in that area as well. So these birds slowly make their way back to a similar region and try and eke out their living alongside their parents. Now, a classic example of this is Taimane, and I hope that this animation is gonna play. You can see Taimane's natal nest up in the top left there. He dispersed all the way down to the KZN coast, just north of Scottborough, and spent some time slightly inland of Scottborough. He then moved up near Warden, a mere 35 kilometers from his original nest. Now, what was amazing about Taimane was that at a mere age of two years and nine months, so not even three years old yet, Taimane was able to successfully breed and hatch two of his very own chicks. This was the first record of age of first breeding in a secretary bird that had ever been confirmed. We had absolutely no idea that these birds could breed this quickly. We think what might have happened is that Taimane was able to find a mature female and hook up with her and under her guidance, he was able to breed really nice and quickly. We know of one other secretary bird called Squeak who was tracked by the Endangered Wildlife Trust who showed a similar um, breeding event where they were quite young and able to breed very quickly. But if this is how quickly these young birds can actually get into the breeding population, 
it does at least bode well. We know the likes of the southern ground hornbills that can take up to nine years before they're able to reach sexual mat maturity. Our secretary birds, luckily, if they can breed this quickly, it'll bode very well for them in terms of being able to reestablish populations if we can sort out the threats in the landscape and make things safe for them to do so. So some hope on that front and a really, really interesting bird to follow. We tracked him right from 2013 up until 2017 and he stayed in that area after moving there and breeding successfully for the duration of our tracking period. So hanging on to that territory really nicely for those years. Now, one of the other really interesting findings that we got from the study was that protected areas really don't cater very well for our secretary birds. Only 3.2% of our dispersing secretary birds actually interacted with protected areas. Now, this may be because a lot of our protected areas are protecting unsuitable habitat, but it also means that a lot of our grassland areas don't necessarily fall under some formal conservation protection. And that really means that we need to start looking at other mechanisms in order to be able to try and save these birds. And we've luckily been able to do just that. And I'll tell you about that in a moment. But what's really key is that I can take all of the scientific information that we've been working on and start to really inform the conservation actions that we're doing. So the work I've just shown you now was published in Ostrich. And we were very lucky to get the cover of that specific edition with our study. It was also during Bird of the Year. So some of the key points that we got out of that um, initial study was that these dispersing juveniles are really able to cover vast distances and they can do it very quickly. So it means that we have to think large scale and landscape scale if we are going to try and protect these birds. We also found that these birds are returning to their region of birth. So that's very important because it means if we have breeding habitat, we need to ensure that the birds are being protected there because it's likely future generations are gonna return there. So as I said, we need these landscape level conservation strategies and through mechanisms like biodiversity stewardship or other effective area-based conservation measures or OECMs. Those of you who attended Daniel Manovic's um, webinar might remember the OECM concept that he spoke about. It's really using lands uh, landscape level conservation strategies where we take conservation as a secondary spin-off of land use. So cattle grazing is a classic one wide open tracts of grass felt for cows to graze on are also really suitable habitats for secretary birds if we eliminate the other threats that might be present there. So now on to some more exciting hopeful aspects of secretary bird conservation and I know I'm going on a little bit long so I won't take too much more of your time on this section but as I mentioned biodiversity stewardship is really our golden ticket to working with landowners and trying to figure out how we protect our grasslands in particular. So this is a group of farmers in the Upper Volche protected environment meeting and discussing ways in which they can manage their land for conservation. And they've also signed on to biodiversity stewardship, which is a mechanism that formally protects their land. It is legislated by the South African government and allows them to carry on gaining economic benefit from that land as cattle farmers, but ensures that that land is managed in a way that keeps biodiversity, not just secretary birds, but biodiversity is safe. Now, I said we've got our grassland environment in South Africa. BirdLife South Africa has been working really hard across this landscape to secure over 70,000 hectares. In these cases, we've actually done close to 100,000 hectares, if not more, of grassland biodiversity stewardship over the years. This is our current stewardship team who are working across South Africa doing an incredible job to secure our grasslands and ensure that they're working with landowners to secure those different sites for biodiversity. And I really do take my hat off to every single one of these farmers, having the consciousness to protect their properties, not just for birds, but to be able to work on that land and still derive economic benefit and yet live in harmony with nature is such a fundamental way that we need to move forward in this world. So I really do take my hat off to these landowners for doing the work they do. And of course, our incredible team of biodiversity stewardship officers out there working with these landowners to bring that message of conservation home. Some exciting hot off the press results. Uh, Robin Kalein, who is our science and innovation project manager, has been working with Ernst to start to unpack the very first habitat suitability models. So what this is showing is areas of South Africa that are in prime condition for secretary birds. And you'll see there are some gaps, as we say in modeling, all models are rubbish, but some are useful. 
So this is a starting point, and hopefully as we get more and more data in from people's sightings, we can strengthen our model and really start to make South Africa a lot more yellow and suitable for our secretary birds. So areas in yellow are good for secretary birds, areas in blue are not so good for secretary birds. So we're hoping to continue developing this model and really starting to unpack what our secretary birds are selecting for. Two of the key things that came out of this was that if we have a look at the NDVI, so this is a measure of greenness and sort of grassland um, health. What we can see from this NDVI score is that habitats that are very much grassland in nature are key. So we knew that already, but it's good to see the data supporting that. And the other key thing that came out of the study was that they really need areas of a thousand hectares of more or more of intact natural vegetation. So large areas of intact grassland, not these little fragmented islands all over the place. We really need to secure big tracts of land if we're gonna keep things good and healthy for these secretary birds. So a big thank you to Robin and Ernst for working on this and I look forward to continuing to develop this model with them. Now, Sally Hoffmeyer back in 2014 also looked at what these birds are selecting for. So you can see the green bars on your screen are felt or natural grassland areas. And this very much speaks to what we already know about these birds. They're not looking to hang out in pasture lands or stubbled areas. They really, majority of the time, are looking for good pristine grassland to do their thing. And the only place where this was an exception was in the Western Cape, where we've obviously seen a lot of agricultural expansion in what was formerly Rhinosterfelt or Valley Bottom. And so in the Overberg and the Swartland, we saw a lot more um, activity of birds in the fallow and the pasture land um, farmlands. But for the majority of the eastern side of the country, these birds are very much sticking to those natural grassland areas. And what we've started doing, this is right hot off the press. I literally animated these this afternoon. We're starting to do what we call foraging island analysis. So I mentioned that these birds are picking up on these little islands of grassland all over South Africa. You can see the two um, settlements on the border of Pretoria and Northwest. And all of those blue dots are points of secretary birds that have been moving. And if you watch that animation, you can see that secretary bird never ever ventures out of the natural wetland system that is still intact and it's doing its thing. And secretary birds actually rely quite heavily on these wetlands, often eating frogs and other little rodents that scurry around in those wetland systems. And if we have a look at some of the initial foraging analyses, we've done the minimum convex polygon. So remember that's the really overestimating analysis. Um, we're finding that these birds are showing on average about a six kilometer squared foraging island. And that obviously varies quite a bit. And what's quite interesting to see as well is that our birds that are in the really prime grassland areas have much bigger foraging areas. And we obviously know that where these birds were, the grasslands are still relatively intact with a lot of cattle grazing going on there. So these birds, if you give them the space, will certainly take it. So lots to still unpack on this aspect of work, but some really exciting studies to come. And hopefully in a year or two, we can speak to you again about more of the lessons we've learned on this aspect of the ecology of the secretary bird. Now, in terms of understanding the impacts of fences, we know that these birds don't do well with fences, but what we're hoping to start doing is to start trying to understand how secretary birds interact with fences. So you can see on the left side there, I've drawn in the farm fence in black, and you can see that bird very much turning away every time it encounters the fence. With our new tracking devices, we were previously um, limited to an hour observation period, our new tracking devices have enabled us to get down to five minute intervals. And you can see that white line across your screen there is a fence line and the yellow lines of Houdini moving up and down that fence line, trying to really work out what to do with this fence and whether to try and go over it or walk along it. And so we're hoping that we can start using this real time tracking data to figure out exactly how these birds are interacting with these fences and what's potentially going wrong when they do get tangled. So some exciting new analyses on the horizon there. We've also started looking at ways in which to prevent this entanglement um, issue for secretary birds. Some of the solutions that we're looking into is obviously trying to get farmers to maintain that tension on their fence. The tighter your fence is, the less likely the bird is to get trapped up in those two top strands. Putting on visual deterrents like flappers is another avenue that we're exploring. 
And there's also been an idea of replacing the top barbed wire with just a plain strand. And this actually works really well for other species like owls and cranes and prevents the birds getting hooked on those barbs. And then of course, looking into alternative barriers. Are there ways that we can come up with fences that are not necessarily barbed wire fence? So lots of exciting movement with our local farmers in the biodiversity stewardship landscapes. And if anybody is interested in doing some fence mitigation work, please do reach out to us. Um, we'd love to have your thoughts and ideas. Um, the sooner we can react on this threat, the better. And the last really, really key thing um, that we're working on is to develop a comprehensive species action plan. This has never been done for the secretary bird. It's been done for a number of other species. Southern ground hornbills, the vultures have a multi-species action plan. Um, the Cape parrots have a conservation action plan. And of course, a lot of the species linked up with AWA, like the white winged flufftail and the lesser flamingo, have plans in place to try and save these birds. So we are rapidly developing this conservation action plan and trying to make sure that we can put the correct measures in place to help all partners and implementers to save this amazing iconic bird. And those of you sitting at home listening, I'm sure are wondering how you can get involved. There are a number of different ways. We really, really need you to be our eyes. I can't be everywhere in South Africa. I certainly wish I could, but I'm obviously here behind my desk doing my thing. And many of you are lucky enough to be out there encountering these secretary birds please send us your sightings. The easiest way for you to do this is on the Bird Lasser app. You'll see the Threatened Bird Species cause and the Bird Life South Africa on your Bird Lasser app. If you sign up for that cause, every time you log your secretary bird sightings, we will get that data uploaded to our Threatened Species database. And that just helps us keep track of where our birds are being seen. If you're not tech savvy and don't want to use Bird Lasser, that's totally okay. You can either WhatsApp your sighting to me or you can email us with your sighting details. The key thing is that we get your GPS location and the date of the sighting. So please have a look, keep an eye out for your birds and send us those sightings. And then of course, as I mentioned earlier, we are looking for nests. If you know of any nests, please send through that information to me. Um, it really does help us just keep track of what's happening with our birds, where our breeding birds are and how they're doing. And if you're really keen on secretary birds, why not share your photographs on our Facebook page? We have a secretary bird Facebook page. You can sign on there, uh, interact with other fellow secretary bird enthusiasts. And of course, you can send us your sightings on that platform too. And citizen science is always a key tool. Ernst gave a wonderful uh, talk on the SABAP2 project a couple of weeks ago. And that SABAP project, if you're atlasing, capture those secretary birds when you see them and submit your incidentals and your full protocol cards with secretary birds and let us keep track of the birds on that database too. So it really does make a huge difference to us to have all of you out there being our eyes and letting us know where these secretary birds are. And a big thank you to everyone who does contribute to these two projects. So that is what I have to tell you all about our amazing secretary birds. But before I close and take questions, there are many, many people, organizations, individuals to thank. Uh, this project's been going for a number of years and I'm sure I've missed people on the slide, but a big thank you to every single one of you who have helped us to find nests, track birds, rehab birds, test things on the different um, rehab birds that we've needed to test. And of course, a huge thank you to our current suite of funders, uh, Nick and Jane Prentice and Letitia Steinberg who are tuned in tonight, the Ruperts who very kindly fund my position at BirdLife South Africa, and of course, the Angula Partnership. And to my co-authors as well, there is still a lot of exciting things to learn about these birds. And we hope to bring you many, many more years of new and exciting knowledge about the wonderful secretary bird. So in closing, I leave you with sage advice from our secretary birds. Dance like a snake is trying to get you in the foot and you'll always be the life of the party. And I'd really just like to thank all of you for tuning in tonight and I will be more than happy to take any questions. Uh, Andrew, I guess I'll hand over to you at this point. Thanks so much for tuning in everybody. Yes, thank you, Melissa. That, that really was an excellent talk, um, both in your delivery but also the wealth of information that you shared with us. And uh, seeing your tracking profiles for different birds, I, I remember when I was running our African penguin GPS tracking project, and the first thing I wanted to do every morning when I woke up was check where you know my birds had gone overnight. And I'm sure you get a similar excitement when you have birds with GPS devices out and deployed. Um, although, of course, it's sad to see how many of your track birds have met unfortunate ends. So to bring us around to my original comments, 
I think the secretary bird is an excellent choice as a favorite bird. And it's so special that you've come full circle from your days as a young girl under your grandfather's guidance um, to your current position as one of South Africa's most eminent conservations. So a big congratulations to you on, yet, on that. I know he would be very proud and, and we at BirdLife South Africa are very happy to have you. Um, it's quite distressing news to hear that the secretary bird, which is of course an iconic, charismatic, African monotypic endemic, um, will be uplisted to endangered. But as you say, there's hope. And I think the species is very lucky to have champions advocating for its conservation. Um, I think it's also a very good example of BirdLife South Africa's uh, science-led conservation ethos. But we do a lot of our own research as well as partnering with individuals and institutions to make sure that our conservation work is appropriate and effective, when, which when there's limited time is uh, so important. And the information, of course, that we get from all these studies will feed directly into conservation actions such as infrastructure planning and land management and so forth, um, especially as part of that ac action plan that you mentioned. So thank you for the work that you and the landscape conservation team do, um, as well as your presentation. And also thank you to all of our attendees for tuning in tonight. Uh, we're gonna take some questions momentarily, but before we do, a reminder to everyone to please participate in the post webinar survey, which will pop up when you exit the webinar. Next week, we welcome Christy Garland, who's BirdLife South Africa's Buckestrum Tourism and Education Center Manager to Conservation Conversations. Christy will be sharing her lessons learned about starting up and maintaining junior bird clubs. Uh, it's imperative, of course, that we draw young birders and nature enthusiasts into the conservation mind flock. And beginning junior bird clubs is a great way to do this. Um, I'm sure, Melissa, you'll agree with me that birds are a great uh, gateway into environmental and nature appreciation. So Absolutely. be sure to tune in next week to see Christy's talk, um, same time, same place. Uh, a reminder again, if you haven't typed in your questions into the Q&A box, please do, um, or you can put them into the Facebook Live comment feed if uh, that's where you've been watching us tonight. So let's get into some of those questions if you're ready, Melissa. Let's do it, thanks, Andrew. Okay, I picked out a few from our chat box before we get to the actual Q&A. Um, and there were two comments that were kind of linked, so I'm going to put them together. Um, there was a comment from uh, Eleanor Mary, um, a good friend of the webinars, who says that amazingly when her mother was a child in Johannesburg in the second decade of the 20th century, so I guess that's the 1910s, um, she saw secretary birds in the Craig Hall and Bordeaux areas, which were Savannah grasslands at the time. Um, and then a kind of comment that linked to that by Amy Fisser, who said there's a call from all around for planting indigenous plants and trees in our gardens, where he lives in Pretoria, Midrand slash Johannesburg area, which was historically grassland. This is actually, well, it may actually be against the natural habitat and actually threatening grassland species. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for those great comments. And uh, I think Gauteng in general, we, we've sort of become this megalopolis of Johannesburg to Pretoria through Midrand. Uh, Gauteng, as, as you very well described, was a grassland and very much the, the south of Johannesburg. And those of you who've been to Sekebos around Nature Reserve, I often stand on Sekebos and look out and think, my word, if I was standing where the Colton Center is currently built back in the 1800s, this would have all been grassland and I probably would have seen secretary birds walking through. Um, some of you may not know, I grew up on the east end of Johannesburg and it was amazing to just watch how quickly we've transformed this corridor between Joburg and Pretoria from these open, wonderful grasslands into this other habitat, this kind of peri-urban and industrialized region. I think sadly, we, we have to kind of admit defeat and say that we've sacrificed a lot of these grasslands to our, our urban population. But uh, I know the likes of Craig Whittington Jones have done some amazing work setting out some very key conservation spaces that are still left within Gauteng to try and maintain those. Sadly, I think the days of watching uh, secretary birds walk through uh, very central Gauteng are probably over. Um, but who knows? I mean, Bling came and knocked around Pretoria for a while. So I think the odd one might still, might still manage to eat out a living here and there, the young and dumb ones. But um, absolutely, I mean, the, the transformation that we've seen across Gauteng is, is insane. And 
I often read these accounts of, of kind of historic Joburg and the wonderful grasslands that were out among the, the different farmsteads that were scattered across the province. Um, sadly, not, not to be anymore now that we've turned the, the world into a paved world, but at least there are still many more tracts of grasslands to the south of Gauteng and uh, long may they last. If we, if we can continue to protect those, our secretary birds will be okay. But thanks for those lovely stories and sharing those anecdotes. Yeah, I think I, I heard somewhere that Johannesburg is actually the largest man-made forest in the world. So there's been a complete habitat uh, change there. Um, yeah, and I mean, with, yeah, with that, I mean, we've seen the most amazing distribution shifts in species because we've altered this habitat. I mean, we look at all these woodland species that are moving into Gauteng, if you track the, the changes in the atlas data. So just to answer that question, I didn't really get to it in terms of planting species and that sort of thing. Obviously, if it is a nice big piece of felt, maybe keep it that way. But if you've got a relatively fragmented patch of grassland and you're putting up the odd tree here and there, it really is benefiting a lot of these new species of birds that have moved into what was formerly grassland. And I don't think as long as it's an indigenous species, it's probably not going to do all that much damage in central Harting. Thanks, that's a, a wonderful answer. Um, and then there's one off our Facebook page from Joachim Voges, who wants to know if roads have any effect on the size of secretary bird territories. And maybe you can just content or, uh, comment on other infrastructure as well. Hey Joachim, thanks so much. That's, uh, that's nice to see you online and uh, thanks for that great question. Um, the truth is we haven't really uh, delved into the data um, to look at that, but it is something that we're starting to, to analyze and tease apart, certainly from my, my personal observations of secretary birds. If they land in a field, they will very much be confined by whatever linear infrastructure, be it road, be it fence. Um, if they encounter that boundary, they tend to just turn away or move along it. Um, so you saw those tracks I showed of Houdini walking up and down that fence line and actually had a, a panic the one day where Houdini had landed on a road and was walking along a road which had barbed wires on either side of it. And it very much looked like someone had picked him up and put him in their car and was driving down the road with him. And uh, to my panic, I sort of thought, oh my goodness, someone's kidnapped my bird. But uh, luckily, a couple of hours later, he'd hopped back over one of those fences and was back into the grasslands doing his thing. So they, they definitely do interact with linear infrastructure, sadly, not always in a positive way. Um, but they tend to move away from it. So it does, having these kind of high density hunting camps in particular that we've started seeing across large tracts of the Northwest has a massive impact on these birds that are very much confined to whatever area you give them. Great, and then another question around habitat and how that might affect the birds. Um, Christoph Fenter picked up on your comment that um, elephants in Kruger are changing the habitats uh, in, in, in the Kruger National Park and that's affecting birds. And he wanted to know if you could just elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Christo, for tuning in. Um, so obviously we've seen a lot of big trees getting, getting knocked down by elephants and that's not just a problem for secretary birds, but raptors in general. Um, we're also seeing a lot of um, the bush encroaching species moving eastwards. And so with elephants being a sort of bulk grazer browser types and um, they're obviously helping disperse a lot of those seeds and that's kind of helping to move a lot of these these bushy species through they're also disturbing the the habitat when they walk so that can lead to other kind of weedy things starting to pop up um, obviously with our secretary birds it's it's really more of the the bush encroachment that's an issue for them less of the elephants but obviously taking out those nice big mature trees is a problem for for our birds yeah, and, and there's a more of a comment than a question here, but Melissa, I think I think it needs a reading out. This is from Adam Sratif, who you mentioned already as uh, one of the founders of this project at Bird Life South Africa. And he, he says that he just wants to thank Melissa for all of her hard work to analyze the data. She did a wonderful job, and I'm so glad that she is now taking this project forward. Um, it was great to put the tracking devices and all the other things he had the privilege to do but it's important to take all the data forward in order to conserve these wonderful birds. Um, so firstly, thank you Ernst for all your um, leadership on this and uh, initiative in getting this going. And I think he touches on an important point there that I tried to address in my post talk comments about taking all the scientific data and now making it into a conservation action. I don't know if you want to talk to that for a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And firstly, thank you Ernst for those very 
kind comments. As I said in the, the lead up to my talk, I wouldn't be here tonight without you. Um, so thank you for all of the hard work. And I know that you share my absolute love for these birds equally. So thanks, Ernst. Um, in terms of taking this forward, absolutely. I, I'm a huge advocate for science communication. Um, it's great to have all these wonderful analyses. And I mean, the things that we can do nowadays with the, the computing power that we have are just mind blowing. But if you can't take that data and turn it into something usable for Joe Public and the man on the street who is actually managing a land, um, a landscape or a reserve or has the, the ability to influence policy, what's the point of having all this amazing data and all this information about a species? It's so key that we can translate that into usable action. And so, yeah, I, I agree with you, Andrew. Having things like conservation plans for species just helps us guide what all the science is saying in terms of how we save these birds. And we obviously can't save them without the science because we need to understand them. And that's where science definitely plays a key role. But taking that science forward and using it in a, a realistic and practical way is absolutely fundamental for everything that we do. And I guess uh, segueing from that, uh, Catherine from Ake wants to know what are the methods that ESCOM are using to avoid accidents? So of course, that is also scientifically informed uh, action. Yeah, how's it, Kat? Nice to have you tuned in too. Um, I'm glad you're asking questions from all my mates, Andrew. They, uh, <laughs> so ESCOM is doing amazing work. Um, this has largely been linked to the strategic partnership, which they have with the EWT. Um, they've got various different methods for trying to, to mitigate the impacts of their infrastructure. Obviously, with secretary birds, collisions are the biggest issue. So that's where birds are flying into the lines. Um, they've put up flapping, what they call flappers, so small yellow devices. You may have encountered them in driving around South Africa. And this is really just to try and make those lines more visually obvious to birds. Um, they've also got devices called owl devices. So those are specifically targeting birds that fly at night. And they shine UV on the lines and try and make it a bit more obvious. That's a bit more pertinent to things like flamingos, which fly at night. But um, one of the other things they do is that they, especially when it comes to putting out new lines, they are really conscious about the areas that they put these new lines up. So we've learned quite a lot about how birds interact with their landscape. So we know, for instance, if you've got a saddle across a mountain, there's often a lot of good wind through there and birds will often use that saddle as a, a bit of a flight path. So obviously running a power line through that saddle is going to lead to a lot of collisions. So making sure that pre-construction, we actually have a good idea of where to really reduce the impact of these lines on birds in particular. Um, we've got a great handle on that. And ESCOM is really proactive about not building power lines in particularly high risk areas. Um, so yeah, they, they're very proactive. And I really, I know everyone gives ESCOM a lot of a lot of grief and a lot of hard time, but when it comes to conservation and really stepping up to mitigate the impacts of their infrastructure, they're not sitting down. They're, they're proactively funding conservation NGOs to try and help them mitigate that. So kudos to ESCOM and again, thanks to the support they show this project. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to think that ESCOM have suspended load shedding just so that we can get through your presentation. And <laughs> and all the thanks, <laughs> <laughs> That's probably not true, but... Um, a related question from Doug Kids, just to clear up, are power line deaths caused by physical damage or from electrical shock? Thanks, Doug. Yeah, so majority are collisions. Um, obviously, if you're a secretary bird flying um, uh, into a transmission line, which can often be 30, 40 meters in the air, um, if you collide with that power line, um, you're often flying quite fast. We see a lot of wing and neck breakages. And uh, that bird, obviously, once its wing is tainted, drops like a stone at great height. And sadly, when they do hit the ground, if they haven't already broken their neck flying into the power line, um, they sadly usually die with that distance um, fall. So they are, they are the odd, um, and I speak under correction here, so please, if any of our ESCOM colleagues are tuned in, I'm sure there has been one or two electrocutions with birds touching both wires with their wings. Um, but it's definitely, from a, select, a secretary bird point of view, it's collision, 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 not e electrocution. Okay. Um, switching tack slightly, Jürgen Zweidemann wants to know, uh, SEBAP2 shows quite a high reporting rate in the Kalafadi Transfrontier Park. How does that correspond to what you found about them preferring grasslands? 
Yeah, thanks, Jürgen. So there, there is a nice um, population of secretary birds up in the Kalahari, and we've actually um, just put in a, a proposal with Sand Parks to hopefully start tracking some of the young birds in the Kalahari. So watch the space if that gets approved. Let's let's hope so. Um, certainly, the, there's SABAP, good SABAP reporting rates for the birds there, but we're still unpacking what it is about those arid landscapes that the birds really like. So we know they're very reliant on water holes and obviously Kalahari um, does provide water which allows them to then move around the landscape and hunt the odd rodent and, and snake um, in the Kalahari. Um, so it's, it's not that they need sort of music stereotypical grasslands. The Kalahari is a really nice open landscape as those of you who've had the privilege of going there, um, only a handful of nice camel thorn trees and a few other shrubs around, but that open landscape is absolutely key for them. And there's obviously a good prey abundance for them to forage on. Um, and a really interesting thing and something I'm dying to see one day, we get these huge congregations of secretary birds around water holes in the Kalahari. And they're obviously being drawn into that water feature in the landscape, which probably does fluctuate their densities a little bit, but, uh, it would be an amazing thing. I've, I've had reports of up to 38 secretary birds in one sighting, which is just mind blowing that, that that's wow. even possible. Um, but they're obviously all coming together. And unfortunately, we don't know if that's a, a sort of juvenile congregation, a kind of a, a singles party to try find your next mate or, or what's going on there. We still, we still need to unpack that a, a lot. But um, how, how amazing to have the privilege to go to Kalahari and, and see all these secretary birds coming together. Um, my few times that I have had the privilege of going to the Kalahari, I've only seen the single secretary bird here and there at the odd water hole. So maybe one day I'll get lucky in, in good summertime conditions to go and see these congregations. Yeah, it's fantastic out there. Um, a sort of linked uh, question from Rob Simmons, who's one of our well-known ornithologists in South Africa. Hi, he Rob. wants to know, are secretary birds in grasslands more successful than birds in other biomes? So I assume he means reproductive output and I assume the answer is once we're in the Kalahari we'll know. <laughs> yeah thanks Rob excellent excellent question and uh, yeah as Andrew said we've been building up this database slowly and my my ultimate evil scientific plan is to maybe have an answer to that one day. Um, we unfortunately haven't been able to monitor a lot of nests particularly in the arid west of the country as we all know it's sparse and finding those nests is quite tricky. But uh, yeah, please, if anybody is frequently moving through the, the Northern Cape and you do know of any nests, let's keep tabs on what's happening with those juveniles and, and start to tease that apart. As I said, when the birds do breed in those Western landscapes, they, they, the conditions are usually quite good. So there's probably quite a high likelihood that they will fledge chicks. Um, but I think we'll need to do a little bit more research before I can definitively put my stake on that statement. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and I'm sure after this webinar, there's going to be a whole lot more eyes out there trying to find secretary birds and report those to your database. Um, Jean Tata has a relevant question and wants to know, uh, between nesting and roosting, how can we be certain of the difference so that they can report accurate sightings? Thanks, Jean. Excellent, excellent question. So it is a bit of a tricky one if you can't actually see into the top of the nest. And obviously, if this is kind of a tree on someone's farmland, please don't uh, go running up there. And those of you who do own drones, please don't harass the birds too much with them. Um, but if there is a way that you, you can get up above the nest and, and kind of have a look or above the tree and have a look down, um, that's going to be your, your best giveaway. Often, if you, if you are sort of standing adjacent to the tree and you can scan the, the top of it, um, you will see a few sticks and twigs here and there and a bit of whitewash along the top of the tree, but it, it is difficult to tease them apart. Um, if you're unsure, you'll, an almost dead giveaway is that you've got both birds on the nest. They do a bit of a bowing display to each other, um, and that's very much a, a giveaway that they are thinking of breeding in that tree. But it is tricky to pick these nests up in the landscape, and unless you've got the bird physically standing or sitting on that nest, it can be very, very tricky. So if you're unsure and you can get back to the nest on multiple occasions or the, the potential nest, um, obviously if you see the bird multi standing on that, that structure multiple times, that's probably a good indication that you, you found a nest. But yeah, it is a difficult one. And yeah, if you're not 100% sure, send it through anyway with a tentative and we'll take it from there. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Chaola Chai wants to know, 
what is the weight of the tracking device on the chick and at what weight do you put the tracking devices on the chicks? For sure. So when we, when we started out, um, we had 35 gram devices, I think they were from, uh, we mostly used Ecotone. We had a range of different um, suppliers, but the, the initial tracking study were Ecotone ones. We have subsequently moved to 15 gram uh, OrniTrack devices, which were very kindly provided by Patrick Byholm and Caroline Howes Whitecross. And uh, they, at 15 grams, um, they're nice and light. They fit the birds really well and they've got a raised solar panel so that the, the feathers don't cover up the device on the bird's back. Um, but we generally tag the chicks at about three kilograms. We prefer not to go under three kilograms. Obviously, we will we'll kind of check how fit and healthy the chick looks um, if they are slightly under three kilos. But the key thing at eight weeks old is that your skeletal structure of the secretary bird is pretty much as big as it's going to get. From eight weeks old to about 10 weeks old, it's very much muscle building. So the birds start to fill out, um, those leg muscles get nice and strong, the chest and the wing muscles start to develop. Um, so what we do when we fit the tracking devices is we always leave a little bit of room for that bird to, to really get its muscles developed nice and strong and obviously um, fill out a little bit more. But that the key thing is that at eight weeks old, that skeletal structure is intact. And we really do try and catch a or capture them before they fledge um, so that we don't run into issues like we did with Houdini who flushed off his nest as we climbed up there to go and fit the tracking device and then we had to walk around trying to find him. Uh, and then kind of linked to the capture and ringing and tracking, Elena Relchik wants to know what size ring do they wear? Do you know this off by hand? I think it's a 16, um, a 16, I want to say D, I might be wrong there, um, off the top of my head, but it's, yeah, it's a size 16 ring. Um, if you have a look in the SAF ring manual, it'll give you the exact, exact size. Okay. I see we've got just a few minutes left, so we're going to try to get through a few more questions. Um, there's a question about whether it's the adult size that it's the main reason it makes them difficult to capture and tag or ring. Yeah, so, so adults, um, A, are very skittish, and it's really difficult to, to get close enough to them that they will spot um, a bell chat trap, which is one of the, the techniques of um, yeah, capturing raptors. So it, it's really difficult to get a secretary bird to, to see your trap. Obviously, they're moving in these long, grassy habitats. Um, there's only one person who successfully caught an adult secretary bird, and it was with a lot of skill and a stroke of luck, um, Malcolm Wilson. He managed to set a, a trap up along a fence line and he had the secretary bird um, off in the distance and sort of counted on the fact that that fence line would guide that bird along it and the bird did ultimately see his trap um, at the end of the fence and he managed to capture it. But it takes a lot of time and a lot of patience and uh, for us it's just from a, a cost effective point of view and a kind of guarantee of getting a bird um, we prefer to work on the juveniles um, just to, to kind of guarantee our conservation buck. <laughs> Great. And Sybil Reagan wants to know, are they ever hunted or persecuted for any reason? Yeah, good question. Um, we don't know a lot of persecution. Um, unfortunately, they have been trapped and there are one or two incidences of them finding their way into traditional medicine markets. Um, and we've also had individuals stop trying to sell birds on the side of the road um, very infrequently, but it does, it does occur. Um, generally, secretary birds are very much viewed as pest controllers and most of the farmers we interact with have a lot of really good positive associations with secretary birds. Um, if you read accounts of sort of Dutch farmers way back into the, the early 1700s, the secretary bird is always a, a good omen on their farms and very few negative um, issues around them being there. So luckily, I think from a, a human and wildlife conflict point of view, unless you're maybe a, a snake breeder, you probably don't have any, any issues with the secretary bird. Okay, Craig McFarlane, who I think will be a familiar name to you, um, says, good evening and thank you for a fascinating insight into the secretary birds. With the recent reports of large locust swarms in Kenya and Sudan, are you aware of secretary birds moving into those areas to benefit the, from the abundance of locusts as a food source? I don't know if you've got some contacts up in Kenya, Melissa. Hi, Craig. Thanks so much for that great question. So 
unfortunately, I have not actually touched base with my um, colleagues up in Kenya. Um, currently, our secretary birds in East Africa are very much restricted to the protected areas. So the Masai Mara, the Serengeti, unlike here in South Africa, our East African birds don't venture off of um, the reserves. But it would be really, really interesting to, to actually touch base with them. And I'll definitely do that. I do have a few colleagues working on secretary birds up there. And um, yeah, thanks so much for that, that great idea. I'll reach out to them and see what they've been up to. I think that uh, really brings to light the importance of citizen science projects like the African Bird Atlas and people Absolutely. contributing to those all across the continent so we can monitor those kinds of changes. And uh, Incidentally, we have a question from Sydney Shema, who is one of the coordinators for the Kenya Bird yes. Map Project. Hi, Sydney. And uh, Sydney says, uh, wonderful presentation, Melissa. Are you looking to develop the species action plan for just South Africa or the Secretary Bird's entire range? Let's be ambitious, Sydney, if you're going to partner with me. And I think we'll have to work <laughs> in Darcy Ogata too. Let's do it. Continent wide Secretary Bird Action Plan. I'll set the workshop up. <laughs> Ambitious, I like it. <laughs> okay, we are over time now, so I'm going to choose one last question for you, Melissa. Thanks, Sarah. Um Sorry we couldn't get to everyone's. You are, of course, welcome to email Melissa and we uh, can answer those outstanding questions. There's, yes, please there's do. There's a, a, a groundswell of uh, questions and comments that I, I think you can go back and, and read up on, Melissa. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Thanks. The last one I'm going to ask you from Eileen Morrison, which I really like it, is not necessarily related to your presentation, but I'm going to be uh, sneaky and ask it anyway. So Eileen says, Melissa, thank you so much for a wonderful talk on secretary birds. I have had the pleasure of seeing them in the Vumba and Zim, Hillensburg, and if she remembers correctly, also the Kruger. Uh, I so admire the work you and other conservationists are doing and will support you as long as I can. However, given the human population growth worldwide, the outlook for birds and wildlife in general and indeed, general humankind, the outlook is pretty dismal. How do you keep your optimism up and keep going? <laughs> <laughs> ah, let me put my philosophical hat on quickly. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a great question. And um, sadly, it's one that I, I often have to sort of wake up in the morning and think, oh, I've got to pull myself together here and keep going. The reality is, yes, we, we are a huge human population, but I think... The amazing thing is that we are more connected than ever and the environmental movement is gaining traction every single day. And I think with situations like we find ourselves in currently with COVID having this huge impact on us and really allowing people to pause and think about the fact that we've really put a lot of pressure on this planet and it's the only planet we've got. And the more pressure we put on it, the less it's gonna be able to support us. And we're gonna see more and more of these devastating events happening. Um, ultimately, I think it will self right sadly, if we don't pay attention, and I'm speaking to you, Donald Trump, that we need to start uh, taking much better care of our environment, because once it's gone, it takes a long time to come back. We've still got great tracts of natural habitat, and we have really good restoration techniques. But we need to put the funding into it, we need to put the support into green, eco green economy, into good green infrastructure investments, we need to be investing in our natural world so that it can continue to support us. So yes, it is very difficult to stay positive, but I think if we lived in a world where the conservationists weren't out there doing what they do, can you imagine where we'd already be? So I think what's been really great for me is doing these webinars every single week. I get to hear colleagues and friends who are doing amazing work around the world. And it might be a very small impact, it might be a huge impact, but every single impact makes a difference and we keep changing the hearts and minds of the right people and we will get to the right place. And uh, I hope that we do it in a way that keeps the amazing biodiversity that we still have with us. I would hate for children and grandchildren to end up in a world that doesn't sound and look the way um, the one that I grew up in did. So we'll keep fighting the good fights and trying to stay positive every single day. And I hope that all of you will too. <laughs> yeah, it's said that we have 10 to 12 years to entirely change the way that we interact with the planet. Otherwise, it's going to be too late for us as a human species eventually. So the time is now. The action is urgent. Um, there really isn't time to get down. I mean, the work's got to get done. So I think that was a fantastic answer and uh, an end to a, 
fantastic presentation, Melissa. So thank you so much for that. As I said, um, if you have any other questions, you're welcome to email Melissa. Um, and I would definitely encourage you, Melissa, to go through the chat box. There's some really lovely messages, and I think your presentation went down a treat. So thank you so much for that. And uh, that's it from us. Um, a good night to you all. Thank you so much, Andrew, and thanks very much to everyone else. We'll leave the webinar open for a couple of minutes with some music for you. And uh, yeah, if you'd like to add any more questions or comments that you'd like answered, please do so. Otherwise, email me and I'll try and get back to all of you as soon as I can. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, everyone. Keep your eyes on the skies and I'll speak to you all next week. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>